Thank you very much, um, everybody. Thank you guys very much for joining us today. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about animal characteristics. Um, and you may ask uh, why this is important as the follow up for um, sheltering number two. Uh, this is key for the, the primary principles that we look for during a disaster, which the first three is safety, 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 uh, both for, for us, um, for our team, as well as the animals and then documentation identification. Um, Erica spent a great time talking about the intake protocols yesterday, and this is kind of a, a forward over, but this goes in depth on one topic, which is that animal characteristics that we'll get into in a second. And we spend quite a bit of time on it, but it is really to push the point that we have to document, we have to identify. Um, this comes from a great learning lesson um, during the Swedes flat fire, one of the Swedes flat fire, I should say, um, where we had three dogs that were housed uh, pretty much next to each other. Um, three black lab type dogs. Um, and the, their intake paperwork all said black lab. Unfortunately, one of these black labs had um, a little accident in his kennel, um, which is no big deal. His little hyper got overexcited, but uh, we had to remove the um, the clipboard of that and uh, a you know good good meaning person set it on top of another kennel that had a black lab type dog on there. We exchanged the kennels. It took two or three of those dogs for a walk and then all of a sudden everybody was looking at each other going wait which one is which. Luckily one of those dogs name was Scar and he had a scar across the, the top of his nose and that's what spurred this conversation to come in. So you may think that we're talking about quite a bit about a, such a simple subject, but it is so important for that documentation and identification to, to make this operation work. And it spans from just being able to return an animal from, from an intake to a release to keep them safe in the shelter, as well as so important to identify animals when we're reuniting, when we didn't know where the owners were when they're intake, to make sure that they go back to the same owners that they came from, to make sure that they get reunited with the right family. So that's what we're gonna be doing today is talking a little bit about the um, characteristics. Um, I have a, a fun, exciting, PowerPoint on this. This one is a very interactive, or at least I usually make it very interactive. So, um, you know, guys, if you can keep up on the, the comments, other, otherwise you'll have to listen to me a little bit more, but we'll just have a little bit of fun with it. So why don't I go ahead and share my PowerPoint, see if that's going to work. Yay. Um, looks like we're good to go. If I can just move this. There we go. So this is the animal characteristics. And again, where this comes into play, but it's not letting me move. There we go. Is a dog much like this. So this is my dog. His name's Colt. He's a little bit of a spazoid. Uh, it's his sweetheart and he is gorgeous. Um, the breed of him is an Australian Kelpie, which isn't too familiar in this area, especially a um, true slick character, um, Australian Kelpie, some are crossed over with Border Collies. Um, he is gorgeous, but at the same time, he looks like many other blue Australian Kelpies, or black and tan, blue and tan. So what we need to do is we need to find identifying marks, identifying characteristics that separate this dog from any other dog, especially this dog from any other Kelpie, where it's gonna be very difficult for us to identify that I'm just opening my screen, making sure that I can see hopefully the comments. Doesn't look like I'm gonna be able to open the comments on this. Chat, maybe, maybe not. I was hoping that this could be tandem, but we will see. <laughs> Chat button. Nope. Okay, John, you're going to have to kind of help me out. Keep an eye on the on the, the comments if you could. Um, we do want these guys to have a little bit of fun with this. But again, this is Colt. So what we're doing is we're kind of going off of the animal intake form that Erica really talked a lot about yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but the last session. But again, just describing the animal at the vehicle, what we have going on. So this 
form is not perfect, but it's what we have the most of. So we put our name here in, up in the animal description, dog, cat, other, the sex, the breed, age, color. And then this key one here is the markings. Is you wearing a collar, wearing tags? <clears throat> excuse me, and microchipped. We got three options on the microchip. Most everybody's not walking around with the nine to 15 digit microchip number that's in their dog or cat by memory. So yes, they know it's microchip, but they can't remember the number. So we mark it here so that way we can identify. This one is if they do know it and or if we implement the, the number, uh, implant the microchip, we can run with that or the no. So fun new rule, new law in January 1st of 2021, it is now a requirement by law that an, any animal control agency, when returning an animal to their home, to their owner, is required to microchip that animal. Um, so the penalty is actually on the animal control agency if we fail to do that. So um, if we have the means to do that, we have to under law. So any animal that leaves us on a day-to-day -day basis um, is microchip. Any animal that leaves during a disaster operation and or at intake um, is going to be required to be microchipped. So we're gonna have a cache of microchips um, that we are going to be organizing and uh, creating a protocol to microchip animals at intake or close thereafter uh, once we scan to make sure that there's not a second microchip. So that is a new law as of 2021, and we're looking forward to the positive results that it's going to do both at daily operations as well as, um, as future disaster response. So here is my filling out of Colt for my intake form, Australian Kelpie. Black and tan technically is the blue and tan, but we'll kind of get into the to the hierarchies of that a little bit. He's approximately three years old at the time that I wrote this. I think he's about five now. Uh, neutered, wearing a collar, um, brown leather, no tags. Yes, he's microchip, but I can't remember what it is. Special needs and remarks. He is a spaz. He's the sweetest spaz you'll ever meet, but definitely is a spaz. So that is a positive. So. Eric had talked a little bit about this, but basically this is an animation of the paperwork process at Del Oro at this moment. We are always talking about Shelterly and how we're moving things forward. But if something happened today, we're running on paperwork while we're implementing Shelterly co coexisting. So that way we can test Shelterly, but always have that paperwork back up. So again, if this is the intake table here and we have our intake owners with one dog and one cat, we're gonna have two intake forms. The intake forms have a yellow, uh, excuse me, a white, yellow, and a pink. Those pinks are the receipts to the owners and they're given back. The whites is kept in the, the master file uh, um, and stored at the intake. The yellows are what's gonna be following the animal. So they follow the animal into the kennel and get placed at that kennel so that way we can always identify that animal until the processing team can come through and basically swap that yellow with an animal care schedule, take the photograph, scan for a microchip, and maybe at that time implant the microchip. We'll see what our protocols say, as well as put a, a paper collar, temporary collar on there with the animal ID and the owner information. So this is what that animal care schedule looks like. And basically it's the daily log, kind of like your 214s, every animal has a 214. And basically, did they get walked? Did they eat? Did they drink, pee and poop? Um, believe it or not, it has detrimental results uh, to determine if they did or didn't uh, pee or poop um, on many animals, much like horses or cats or anything along those lines. What we're doing today is focusing at, on this top section. So I am a big proponent to writing outside of the lines just because I want information in there. We will try and keep it within the lines at this moment. But what we're gonna be talking about is this top area right here, basically species, breeds, colors, markings. Basically, again, this paper stays with that animal for its entire stay at, at the, the shelter. So we need to make sure that this paper correlates with that animal at all times, no matter what, what animal is next to them, um, so they don't get crossed up or mixed up. 
So let's talk a little bit about the picture that goes on. So each animal gets a picture with their um, animal ID number, the owner's last name and the date they came in. So this um, vicious um, calico cat, I would call it, um, is getting their picture taken. This is one of our trainings. I added in there that we're gonna be doing the neck tag, the temporary collar, as well as scanning for a microchip and or maybe implanting the microchip. But this picture will evolve um, towards the end of this, um, this presentation and you guys are gonna kind of help me in, in that realm. So let's talk about why we're here. Dogs, primarily we're talking about um, different characteristics between weight, the coat, the ears, the nose, and the tail. So everybody knows the difference between a pug and a Labrador nose. One looks like it ran headfirst into a brick wall. The other looks like a normal dog. So um, we're talking about that being the separation between the nose. We have the dolce cephalic and the brachial cephalic. Those are the fancy words for the long nose and the short nose. Not things that you guys necessarily have to know, but if you have a Labrador with a pug nose, that is definitely a different characteristic that is gonna separate this Labrador type dog from another Labrador type type dog. And that's gonna be that key to articulate the difference. And tails is a good picture of a, a pug tail. You got a little corkscrew. There's always ones that have the feathery tail or a bob tail, a long tail, short tail, anything along those lines. I don't know. I did have to abbreviate this a little bit to make sure that we had time for questions and comments and things along those lines. So I'm not sure what I pulled out, but under the AKC, this is the description of what large, uh, what the weight um, separation is. So we classify any dog in the realm of one to 10 pounds uh, as a toy. If you have a dog that's smaller than a pound, um, that's not a dog, I'm sorry. Uh, small between 10 and 30, uh, medium 30 to 50, 50 to 90, and 90 plus is your extra larges. So does that make a difference? No, most Labrador is going to fall into the, the large category. But if you have a dog that looks like a Labrador, but it's a medium sized dog, that's going to separate from one to the other. And you're going to hear me say that a lot today because that's what we're doing. We're separating one versus the other. So we got curly, long, silky, long, thick, medium, short, flat, and short, thick hair coats. Oh, and the wire, can't forget the wire. So this is kind of a blaze through to talk a little bit about the coats. Do you need to know exactly what a uh, wire hair terrier is gonna, coat's gonna have? Or do you, know, do you know the difference between a Labrador having medium hair or a um, Sharpe having short, thick hair? or short flat hair, anything along those lines? Not necessarily, but if you're gonna be able to tell me this, the difference between one dog and another, that's where this is gonna come in most important. This integrates great into chameleon because what happens in chameleon, if we can articulate all of these traits that are based off of AKC, we can punch in all of these traits and it'll give us the best estimate for what that breed is based upon its hair color, weight, um, tail, muzzle, and so on and so forth. So ears, pretty self-explanatory. The cropped, the droopy, all your hound dogs. The drop, those are fun. Those are a little bit above um, the droopy. Erect, semi-erect, and then the rose. So cropped is a medically altered um, ear, basically made to stand up when it's not supposed to. Um, I can't tell you that there's more prettier animals than a Rottweiler or a Doberman Pinscher that doesn't have their ears cropped. I think they're just gorgeous and they don't need to have their ears cropped, but that's just me. The droopy, um, let's see, no, nope, it's not gonna let me. Um, trying to pull these, these pictures off real quick. Let's see if I can do this, just because I had to, to drop a lot of slides. So that droopy um, ears right here, you notice how the ear is connected and the skin's pulling the hair down. So you basically have a big forehead. That's the difference between the drop. The drop has a flat line across the top. This is where the ears are up, but kind of rolling over. Hey Ryan, we're not seeing anything yet. Can you share your screen again? Yeah, it kicked me off when I took it out of presentation view. 
So um, again, droopy is basically when you get to see that forehead and the ears are hanging as low as they can. Um, the difference between the droopy and the drop is there is no forehead on the drop ears. They're basically folded over right at the top of the, the crown of the, the ears. Semi-erect, it's nice and easy. They go up a little bit and then fold over. And then the erect ears. Those are the bad ears. Um, the Kelpies, Shepherds, many others will have this and they're, they're great. The Rose, I always describe it as a, as a semi-erect with a pinch. So it's trying to fold over, but it looks like it's kind of pinched to the side. So this one will come in handy when you have an infection or an injury to an ear that makes it fold over in a different direction um, than what the other ear is doing. Because in most cases, if it's natural, it's gonna be happening bilaterally. But if not, and there's an injury, much like we're gonna talk about in the cats, that, um, that, that comment is going to be, be key um, to separate one animal from the other. Yeah, let's just move it all over. I know I'm on a time crunch. I'm sorry, John. So nose. So we got the pug nose. Everybody knows the pug nose. But then we have the long nose. That's the um, dolce cephalic. You're going to see that in a lot of your sight hounds, your whippets, your um, Afghans, your salukis, your borzois, and anything along those lines. Those where you basically don't have a, a forehead kind of bending down. The long bearded is pretty self-explanatory, long nose, but it's got the, the beard. Um, medium, this is kind of your Labradors, your pit bulls, and then your shorts, kind of the, the, the medium between um, your, your Labradors and your pugs. Uh, don't have as many breathing problems, but definitely it's got a little bit of wrinkles to it. Uh, this one's this one's pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to go too crazy into it. Um, the one thing that I like to to comment on is the difference between um, the long and um, the short. So everybody knows what a bob tail is, but if you go into the long tail, that if it was hanging down, it's going to be past or at his hocks. Whereas this guy's got the shorter tail, and it only comes down to his stifles. So one of those is going to be a good separation characteristic to um, to one dog versus the other. And this is why we're all here. We're going to talk about the markings. So most everybody, as I've been talking in this presentation, is thinking about their own dog saying, OK, how can I tell my dog different? Right. Right. Yeah, you guys are all excited. Yeah, I see it. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the markings because there's always a marking. There's always a way to tell the difference between one dog and the other. So I put in a, a few of the different aspects. Still not letting me pull up the comments. So let me know, John, if, if anybody's yelling at me. Will do. They're asking about um, are the ear distinctions too complicated for the lay volunteer? And will there be a, are there any charts or something available that we could have somewhere? Hmm. Um, you know, that that is not a bad um, bad idea. We can add some AKC as far as what we previously talked about, um, you know, as far as the markings and the ears and things along those lines. Um, this will be a little bit more explain, ex, explained during this markings um, setting, but most of it, most of that was leading up to to what we get here. We're getting your your detail detail attention focused on um, what's one versus the other, but I do like the idea of having some charts with the AKC, the weights, the tails, and things along those lines to help refresh everybody. So good idea. So talking about markings, there we go. So what we want to do is we want to be specific, but we don't have to give every detail. I don't want you to um, catalog and articulate every spot in a Dalmatian, but with this guy, if you got a big can't heart on its left rib. That's definitely something to mark down on both the yellow copy as well as the animal care schedule that he's got a left heart because if we find another one at the shelter, I'll have one and probably my mom will have another one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but if you look at this guy, this guy is a, um, you know, whether we call him a Queensland healer, Australian cattle dog, anything along those lines, it doesn't really matter necessarily. But if we articulate that he's got a big brown spot in the middle back, we're going to be able to articulate that this 
whatever dog we call it is separate from most any other dog um, based off of that spot. So patch versus mask. So under the AKC, a mask includes the eye and an ear. A patch only includes the eye. And so if you notice on the left, um, that is definitely a patch on that King Corso. And then the right is a blue Merle Queensland with a bifurcated bilateral uh, mask. Um, you know, uh, other fun things would be the brown eyebrows, um, you know, the puff of, you know, white or blue on his right cheek, something along those lines, um, white on his forehead, things along those lines, those little details that we're, we're separating. So um, let me go back into the presentation mode because it's more fun. Can you still see the presentation? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So um, this one I already cheated and, and showed you. What is this, a, a patch or a mask? And so, yeah, this is a mask. This is a mask over his left um, eye and ear, black mask. So it'd be a black and white dog, short, flat hair with a long tail, four white paws, ma black mask over his left, left eye and ear. So pretty good description on, on that dog. So what would you say about this guy? So we got maybe a, a pit type, pit terrier, bull terrier, American terrier, bull terrier, anything kind of in that mix. Uh, we got a short stocky frame with a medium muzzle, short flat hair, uh, long tail, uh, but we got some brindle spots and that's what I'm gonna be looking at. Whatever we call him, the owner may come in and say he's a, um, you know, a Rhodesian rich back cross with a, with a Great Dane, I, I don't know. But ultimately, I'm I'm looking at the the patches. So whether this one's going to be the one that's that's identifiable the best for me, uh, Brendel patch over the right eye, you know that's going to kind of pinpoint it. Do I have to talk about the four to five other patches that I I can see? Probably not. That one's going to be able to identify. So be creative. <coughs> Um, but detailed. So this one's kind of fun. I always use this one. This one, I believe they call it a chimera. Um, this one has 50% of the DNA of a yellow Labrador and 50% of the DNA of a black Labrador um, split separate, not a, not a blend. So what would we, what would we describe on this one? Definitely a Labrador type with medium muzzle, um, long feather tail, long bushy tail maybe. Um, but definitely what I would be talking about is that left ear being black or maybe the tan spot on the left black ear or that the left foreleg is completely black. Those are the yeah, ones Brian, that I'm going to, yeah. My people are typing in uh, black left front leg, uh, left ear black with tan patch. Perfect. Perfect. Yep, definitely. You know, because what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to say, well, this patch kind of looks like Italy or this patch kind of looks like Japan. I'm not going to be going that in depth. I'm going to be kind of marking this, not not saying that we wouldn't be talking about this dog every day of, of him being at the shelter, but it's going to separate one Labrador from another. OK, so breeds, you know, um, again, I, I prosecuted a felony case of a dog that was a pit bull terrier type dog. Um, and I use type dog quite a bit in my day to day operations just because it is a generalization. Um, it was a pit bull type dog where the owner said that it was a Rhodesian Ridgeback and Mastiff mix. And I said, great, it's a pit bull type dog. It had the stature, it had the muzzle, it had the build, it had the structure. So breeds, it's more about what it looks like than what it truly is. Uh, there are more breeds than anybody can imagine. I just heard of a new one um, the other day that somebody wanted us to put in the, the computer system. Um, can't remember. One recently that I do remember was a Caucasian mountain dog. Um, looks to me like a... Um, like a great Pyrenees cross with an Akbosh. Um, why we have to call it a different breed, I'm not sure. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with the breed, you list the traits. In chameleon, shelterly, we don't talk about breeds, but 
Um, we don't have any terrier mixes. We, we love the small um, Heinz 57 dogs that we just classify them as terrier mixes. Unfortunately, we, we can't do that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna list the contrast of what um, breed it looks like. So what breed is this? Any good ones out there, John? Uh, doodle. Not How bad. Chow lab mix, thick medium coat. Nice, nice. I like I like the creativity. So uh, at sheep the, dog. Sheep dog. Yep, yep. So at the at the shelter, we have a joke. Um, we call them a, a thick. Um, so it's a it's an F if I know, um, but. Um, Again, we're going to talk about the the characteristics of it. So we got, you know, a, a short curly hair, uh, short, not so much wire hair, medium bearded. Um, ears are are between a drop and a and a droopy. Um, it's actually a Portuguese water dog, but if we called him a poodle type, a sheepdog type, labradoodle type, absolutely, um, I would go with any of those across the board. Well, Shannon T guessed that, so she wins the prize. There you go. There you go, food to be delivered later. Um, so what type of dog does it look like? I used to have this, I still have this slide up and I used to tell the story between the Border Collie and the McNabb because the story that I got was that a gentleman named Jonathan McNabb line bred Border Collies to become the McNabbs that they are today, which I did find out is not true. Um, they do have a mix of a few other things, but definitely I would probably call this um, one on the left, the Border Collie, would I call this one a Border Collie mix? Absolutely. Um, would I call him a McNabb? Absolutely. Um, with the square head, I may lean towards a, a pit mix, but I would lean more towards the color and the speckling to be more of a predominant Border Collie-esque um, type animal. And that's that's what we're looking for is what does it look like? Um, he, it's actually a, a McNabb, but um, not too many people are familiar with that breed. So colors, colors and patterns, um, fun battle between um, all of them. If you ever go to a dog show or a cat show, um, turn around and, and walk out. Um, they are very, very opinionated about what colors and what breeds and what shades of everything, um, which is wonderful for them because they, they love it so much that they dedicate their lives to it. Uh, I'm not that dedicated in, in that spectrum. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Brendel, Speckle, Dapple, Party, Harlequin, and Merles, and then argue the difference between yellows and tans, blues and grays, um, creams and whites. So up to interpretation, um, a tricolor Yorkie is called a party. Um, I call it a tricolor Yorkie, um, but it is actually a, um, a classified color um, in the Yorkie and others as um, a party colored um, Yorkie. And then a Harlequin is um, similar in the Great Danes, um, usually not so much in the tan or the tricolor, but definitely that speckled and, and dappled. So the Merle. Um, I've, I've dealt with a lot of cattle dogs and working dogs. Merle is a common terminology for me, but can you call this speckled? Can you call this ticked color? Absolutely. You know, getting the point across on paper. So not just that, you know, that somebody else knows what you're talking about is going to be the key. So you have the blur, blue Merle on the left and then the red Merle on the right. Again, with the, your, your masks and your spots. Dapple, that's always a fun one. So dapple is basically your white with spots, but it's got another color thrown in there. Um, so you got the Catahoula um, hound dog on the left um, with a kind of a red or a brown dapple. And then you have your little doxy um, with the gray or black dapple. Brendel, this is the one that I kind of want to push on is um, what color do you see first? So on the left, that is classified as a black brindle brown. And then the one on the right is a brown brindle black. And that's based off of what color you see first or what the primary or predominant color is. So that's, that's how we, we categorize brindles. So the one on the left was classified as a buff. The one on the right is classified as a fawn. People would argue, well, he's fawn because he's got a black muzzle, sure. Um, is he tan with a black muzzle? Yeah, 
He's also tan with a black muzzle. So whether we call him buff, tan, fawn, um, anything along those lines, we're gonna get the point across. Um, but articulating that this guy was, was groomed recently, he's got a nice haircut. Um, absolutely, this guy's you know got the droppy ears with the red collar and the black muzzle. Um, you know, wonderful descriptions, whether you call him tan, buff, or fawn. Uh, gray versus blue. Um, I think they classified the one on the right as blue and the one on the left as gray. I can't remember. Um, but, you know, both are going to be uh, similar color, wherever you call them, gray or blue. Um, what I'm going to look at is the, the coloration. So the one on the left, you have a white spot on the chest. But what I love to look at, and I did all the time when I was a field officer, is look at the toes. You know, you can really identify a lot of animals by their toes. Uh, you know, the back right, um, his whole foot is white versus just the toes on the other feet. And that's gonna be a good separation um, identification mark for, for him. The, the pup on the right, you got the, the rose ears because they're kind of pinched to the side and they got the white chest. Um, on there, you know, pretty pretty good explanation. At the same time, there may be a lot going on, um, you know, that are similar to that pit type pup that that are blue or gray with white chest. So, you know, be be creative. You can't see all of them. I don't know what if he's got white toes on his on his back feet or anything along those lines. So, feline and psychopathy. Um, that is a running joke in my world. Um, you do not see, let me go back. You do not see um, an animal with more weapons in the smallest package in the entire world and, and think it's safe. Um, you can't put five weapons on a 10 pound animal and say that it's okay, but that's just me. So if you thought dog, um, dog shows were bad, cat shows, you gotta love them. They are wonderful people, but I learned more about cats when I was creating this presentation than I will ever want to know. And a lot more than we're ever gonna go in depth on this. Um, there are more cat breeds than, than I can ever imagine. We're gonna stick to the basics, the color, hair length, muzzle length, ears, and eye color. So pretty self-explanatory, you know, eye color is good, good, um, identifier for all of your solid cats, you know, your blue Russians, your black cats, anything along those lines. A lot of them will have different colors, whether they're, they're green eyes, amber eyes, orange eyes, things along those lines, and it's a positive, positive indicator. Ears, we don't see a lot of difference um, in our domestic animals. Uh, many of our domestic animals, um, you see them in the Scottish folds, or the munchkins or things along those lines. But this is the one that's important for the injuries. You're gonna see a lot of tomcats or ex-tomcats that have a hematoma that healed and it's got one ear flopped over. And that's gonna be a positive identifying mark to separate um, that. So the injuries can cause abnormalities just the same as any colorations. Um, muzzle length, we don't see too many um, domestic or free range cats that are, that are short muzzled. Um, they really have a hard time upper respiratory issues and things along those lines. Um, I always claim that they're, they're in the, the side of running into a brick wall as well. But hair length, um, like I said, there's a lot of breeds out there. Um, you know, the, the American short hair and, um, oh gosh, just so many. We classify it in three different categories, and that's long-haired, medium-haired, and short-haired, and that's the domestic long hair, uh, DLH, DMH, and DSH. Um, so going from top um, with that orange tabby, um, he's a domestic short hair, uh, domestic long hair, got full bushiness on there. That domestic medium hairs are a little bit tougher. What we're looking at mostly there is gonna be their neck, their mane, and their tail. If they kind of look like a short hair, but they have that nice fluffy mane or uh, fluffy tail, they're going to be a medium hair. Colors and patterns. I used to have a slide in here that told me um, eight different types of tabby cats, and I never knew that there are so many different de definitions of tabbies. So the ones that I'm going to talk about is the 
the tabby, the galoot, the calico tortoise shell, and the the Siamese are the points. So we got a calico versus the torty. If anybody ever finds a male calico, please call me. I'll split the profits with you, especially if you can breed. Um, no. So a tortoise shell and a tabby are a genetic um, aspect that is primarily and um, should be 100% in the female category because in the X chromosome, that's what colors the carries the color chromosome. So one X chromosome carries the orange, one X chromosome carries the black, and therefore that's where you get the orange, black, and the white base, or vice versa with the, the tortoise shell. So if you see a male that is a calico or tortoise shell, that means that they're an XXY and therefore should be sterile. So if he's breeding capable as well as an intact male, uh, could be worth um, a few thousand dollars to you. But ultimately, a calico is going to be a white base with black and orange, and a tortoise shell is going to be black base with some orange, usually some white. Um, they do have a part of um, Satan in them. I'm not sure why, but tortoise shells are definitely not my best friend. Um, they, they love to hate me. So points, usually classified in the Siamese type cats, uh, described as the color pattern of the ears, mask, and tail. Uh, with mostly the cream and white being the body. So here's your normal seal point, your normal Siamese cat um, seal point with the, the black or solid color, um, ears, mask, tail, and, and paws. And then we go into the flame points. Um, I'm preferable to orange tabbies because they are the only cool cat in this world. Um, so this one is my favorite in that denomination, but he's the orange tabby. Um, colorations with that cream or, or solid body color. And then the lynx or the tabby point have the usually gray, sometimes brown tabby markings of the um, ears, face, arms, and, and tail. Tabby, much like um, dogs, and we're talking about the Brendel world, it's what you see um, with an underlying base coat. So basically black or white is going to be your base. What other color do you see? So of course, orange with a white base and then there to the right, you see gray um, with the, the black base and that's gonna be your gray tabby. So dilute versus standard. Uh, so you have your standard tortoise shell there to your left and your dilute um, tortoise shell to your right. And that is exactly what we're talking about. You take your normal color and you dip it in a little bit of bleach for a minute and you get um, you get the dilute standard. Most in cases, you're gonna see that in the tortoise shell, uh, calicos a little bit, um, tabbies, like orange tabbies, you'll, you'll see them. They're quite often called as peach tabbies, but technically they're just a dilute orange. Um, so basically it's still describing the same, same coloristics, but just a diluted form of that. So basically you get to try this one. What are you guys going to be pointing out on, on this guy? Folded ears. Yep. So I'm going to go definitely folded ears. I'm going to do domestic either medium hair, domestic long hair, depending upon if he stands out, big bushy tail. I'm going to go um, probably a brown tabby with the, the brown on the chest, um, you know, tan eyes, folded ears. Absolutely. Uh, this guy's pretty easy, pretty fun. Um, you know, he's definitely got a bob tail. He's got a little black spot on his tail, um, black left ear, blue eyes. Um, what we don't want to see is we don't want to see a white cat, you know, on that, that description. So you guys recognize this picture. We're back to the beginning. So we got um, this S4A, uh, Miss Finley's cat. It's a calico. We identified some, some markings on this cat and we're required by law to take a picture for both our safety as our um, documentation, as well if this is an owner unidentified animal to make sure that it gets out onto uh, social media. So a uh, positive for us is that we can capture multiple pictures. So we already identified this animal has special markings. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take pictures of those special markings. 
right alongside that um, that whiteboard right after the initial one that identifies what animal it is. So that way we can put it on that animal care schedule um, and we can attach those photos, hopefully soon with Shelterly and other technology that we can attach a picture right to the animal care schedule right on the cage. So that way we know what animal we should be housing in that, that kennel. Until then, this needs to go up onto social media or any of our legal websites to make sure that they are um, advertised um, or published is the correct word to make sure that the animal can hopefully be identified to the owner and reunited um, throughout the process of the disaster. So that is the end of my presentation today, guys. And I know it was, it's very fun to talk about this. I, I love when it, we do it in a classroom where you get to interact more. So hopefully you guys picked up on some things. I know you guys have picked up on the idea that this whole module is talking about details. And this spreads not just from the animals, but to make sure that when you're looking at that paperwork, that those details are accurate, not just the markings of the animal, but every box is filled that's needed, that every every box is checked to make sure that we we are dotting our I's and crossing our T's. You know, we're, we are here for the animals at the same time, we gotta protect ourselves with documentation and identification to make sure we can be here next time for the animals. And that's key for me. So with that being said, I will open it up to, to John or anybody that has any questions. Are you able to read the, uh, the chat? I'm pulling up. I think so. I can see most of it now. I'm trying to figure out um, equal details for exotics. Um, yeah, good question, Marty. So um, I don't have the, the AKC on many of the, the exotics, but absolutely, we're looking for identifying marks, one that separates one ball python from another. Uh, ball pythons and red-tailed boas and things along those lines are a similar case to your, your black cats or your black Labradors that are very similar and you're looking for one detail, one little um, pattern that looks different than another to, to help. It keeps moving, moving on me as I'm reading the question. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, the AKC traits as I talked about, the weight, long hair, um, coat, muslin things like that is is primarily a warm-up um, and at the same time I've had 30 pound dogs that look like a Labrador so that's one way that it's going to separate you know saying that this Labrador looks like a Labrador but is a medium size you know that's where we're going to be pulling those those traits from primarily um, if we really can't figure out the breed we'll we'll pull somebody in there with the AKC traits put it into chameleon and we'll get our best guess Yes, breed, but in most cases, you guys, you know, are, are great subject matter experts in, in that world. Uh, back to the example of the Black Lab, what if there is no scar and they're extremely similar? So good question. Um, so one thing in our protocols that our shelter managers are, are aware of now is we, um, we had the protocols of using those temporary tags, neck tags, um, but they are now um, mandatory to be placed on um, with that animal ID, that's going to hopefully alleviate that issue completely. Uh, second, secondly, um, I don't want animals from different households um, that look similar housed side by side the best we can. Um, the three black labs that we had, two were owned by, the, by one person and one was owned by a, a second party. Um, so we, we have, been doing our training as the shelter managers um, and the dog leads and the cat leads to try and separate those animals, not only for the contagious disease, but as well as for, for helping to identify t the, the separations. Um, but I think with the use of those temporary collars and classes like this to make more people aware of those details that we may or may not miss, that um, it, it will help us in the long run. Uh, Rebecca, I, I, I love the idea of, of having the, the basic descriptions and kind of get your guys' creative juices flowing. Um, 
for for not just the AKCs, but just getting those details and, and taking a second look at it. Okay, Sandy, Sandy makes the, the point that I kind of skimmed over, so I apologize for that, Sandy. So yeah, the animal intake form is going to be relatively generic with not a lot of the markings on there. So the markings are going to be filled in when that animal care schedule gets transitioned inside of the shelter, because most cats are in um, carriers at the beginning um, you know, of check-in. So what they're going to do is they're going to write down it's you know, an orange tabby or something along those lines. But when they're coming out of their carrier, or they're inside that shelter and we're transitioning from that yellow copy intake form to that animal care schedule, that's where those, those kennel, kennel assistants, um, you know, cat leads, dog leads, or anybody is going to take the time to look at that animal and identify those um, descriptive characteristics and transcribe it onto the animal care schedule as well as backlog it onto that, um, that yellow sheet. And that's where that, that information is going to come because we agree you're not going to get a whole lot from from within a carrier. Okay, poster. Microchipping should help too. Absolutely, microchipping should help. Um, we just need to kind of create how we do that when we get a, a rush of intake, making sure that we, we can systematically and methodically microchip those animals on intake, um, you know, or right near intake, make sure that they're documented on both the animal care schedule, as well as they get into shelterly and or chameleon um, to make sure that we have the information that we need as well as, as keep those guys um, separate. So absolutely. Um, so will ID collars be mandatory for cats? So that's still in debate. We are using the ID collars on the front of the, the kennels. Uh, for right now, whether we place them on a um, on a um, on a cat is still kind of in question. The difference between the cat and the dog is the dogs go out three to four times a day outside of their kennel, so that's where we need to identify them. Cats, ninety percent of the time, will stay in that one kennel that they're placed and or move once with all of the equipment, so it's not as concerning. Um, to not have those white collars on. So we're still working on that, that process. Um, tech tags. Oh, Tyvex tags. Mm, uh, no, Scott, the Tyvex tags are not required by law. The Tyvex tags are required by me to be used to, for every animal or every dog at least uh, within the, the small animal shelter uh, for just this occasion. The requirement by law is the microchipping of all an animals, all dogs and cats return to the owner um, that have been impounded by an animal facility. Um, we're taking that one step for, forward in disasters and saying that we wanna start implanting microchips on intake for um, identification as well as we know um, 95 percent of all of these animals go back home and the five percent of strays or owner unidentifies um, will go to other facilities to be adopted to a new home if we're not able to find the owners. Um, this needs to be placed under the direction of a DVM. So yes, microchipping um, does invade the skin, um, doesn't need to be implanted um, under the direction of a DVM. No, it actually does not. It is one operation that does not need to be um, administered by a veterinarian, at least as far as I'm aware of, unless somebody wants to bring up, um, bring um, you know that to my attention. Um, it is a, a a non-invasive, but it is much like a vaccine, but larger needle. Um, it does require um, cleaning of the skin um, for for preventative aspects, um, but the implant the implanting is not required by a, a DVM or an RVT. So. Let's see, um, Pamela, do we have a, a place on the animal care schedule to, um, to mark that they have been or are microchipped? Um, no, that is where we're kind of recreating the, the animal care schedule with Shelter Lee's help um, to be more of a cage card or a kennel card um, that we use at our local shelters that will include a photograph as well as all the intake information that we need and that will include the microchip. Meanwhile, um, we're working on that protocol for the microchipping to make sure that that sticker is added 
um, somehow in the records, whether it's on an animal care schedule, um, those animal care schedules, you know, just kind of get muddied up and dirty. So we were really focusing on how we get that number into the system to make sure that it's logged in and recorded at all times. Um, what about rabbits and birds? Kate, if you're talking about the microchip um, requirements, um, so the law specifically states dogs and cats. Um, so that is what we are required by law. I have no problem microchipping rabbits, um, at least none that are industrial. Birds are a lot more sensitive. I'd have to get, get an expert. If we have them, I don't mind it at all, but I'll be honest with you, I've never microchipped a bird and therefore would be not be comfortable microchipping until I got proper training. Okay, we promised everybody that we get them out of here by 7 p.m. So you got eight minutes left. Okay, um, sounds good. So um, what happens if an owner um, freaks out the discover? So one of the intake um, changes is going to be um, educating owners that their animal will be microchipped um, at intake. And if they're not okay with that, then they have the option to take their animal to another facility. Sounds harsh, but unfortunately, if they drop their animal off to me as an animal control agency, it is classified as impounded, impounded for the owner. And I've been advised by, um, by uh, county council that it is, um, it is requirement for us to microchip upon release, return to the owner. Wonderful, thank you, Thomas. Um, <laughs> yes, Debbie, we're, we're getting more chip scanners at intake and uh, across the board. Um, going back very similar, um, back to the black lab mix up, if there is no scar and they're very uh, extremely similar, um, do the best you can as, as far as the descriptions, but if that's the case, then I'm gonna say put two Tyvex collars on, you know, just for, for that big of a, a an identification, or we can call the owners and see if we can put some, um, you know, some um, back tag color on them or something along those lines to keep them separate. Um, I have chalk markers that I use on cattle to, to separate animals. You know, it's not gonna hurt them by any means. We'd probably have to, to advise the owner or ask the owners, but um, those Tyvex collars are gonna be kind of our key. The microchipping is gonna be our second support um, and spacing is gonna be be the difficult one. So um, be happy to talk with you more, more at length on that, um, um, you know, out, outside of this, if, if you're interested. Um, Any special tips on pocket pet ID or same as the dog and cat exotic girls with similar rabbits and birds. So yeah, pocket pet IDs is gonna be similar. We're looking at the we're looking at the the descriptive characteristics, the differences, the patches, anything along those lines that separate one from the other. Um, comment here was the exotic room was filled with um, similar rabbits and birds. Absolutely, it was. It was very difficult. Uh, luckily, they weren't leaving the cage. So once we were able to positively identify them, they were pretty well um, secure in that location. Um, and many of them were out or owned, at least in the rabbit world, um, by the, the same owners. Uh, all we can do is the best we can. Um, this is to create awareness and, and to look for those details. And if you guys are asking me detailed questions like pocket pet IDs and the rabbits and the birds, you guys are already thinking about that. And that's that's the biggest step to this is looking for those, those details, looking for those separations. And if you see a problem, looking to, to the chain of command to identify um, better solutions. 